Hello, today uh, me and Professor Backer will be discussing chapter one of his book, uh, an epilogue as an introduction, the UN experts call for decisive measures to protect fundamental freedoms in China and homesickness in international human rights law. How are you doing today, Ms. Professor Backer? Well, that is quite a chapter title, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's probably longer than the chapter itself. But what, what I wanted to do was kind of get a sense of what you were in for, uh, which required somewhat of a longer title. And I'm doing fine. I'm uh, looking forward to our uh, little discussion about chapter one. And by little, I mean short, that we don't bore <laughs> our, our listeners to, to death. Well, I think that the the um, chapter title matches the chapter because it sand sandwiches in so much information and such of a small amount of space. So, um, and then there are many different themes throughout this chapter. The first theme I wanted to touch on with you would be your discussion on homesickness and nostalgia. When I was reading this chapter, it felt as though there was a drumbeat going along. And I think maybe you touched on this later in the book, but this uh, serenade of nostalgia, and you talk about it, and it doesn't seem to be a positive tone when you talk about nostalgia, not in a bright and happy way, as many of us may look back at things, but more so in a way as though what you have, are looking back at has been lost and can never be recovered. Can you speak on that? Yeah, yeah, it, it, and yeah, I was, <laughs> that was actually one of the things that really struck me about the, uh, the UN expert call. It, it was an extraordinary document uh, because uh, it, it's one of those rare instances where you have what appears to be a near unanimity among the UN human rights special procedures, that is the uh, human rights experts across a broad range of, of uh, areas uh, that have been created uh, for the purpose of um, monitoring or expanding or discussing or providing uh, capacity building in a variety of areas of human rights. And to have all of them together sign the letter was uh, somewhat extraordinary um, and, and, and very powerful. But at the same time, um, this occurs at the very end of the process. And of course, what, what I'm doing, and that goes back to the title, I start with an epilogue that is the end. And so in a sense, what we have is this large group of experts representing in a sense, a consensus among the elite operators within the human rights edifice of the United Nations, looking at this, but in a way that is ultimately, it's, I'm trying to, to, to think of a, a, of a nice way of saying this, looking at it, the way one looks at a, uh, an event or a thing that has now passed, recognizing that whatever it was that they held dear is now perhaps to be spoken about more and more in the past tense. Uh, and that thing, right, that they're looking at, that, that homesickness, that is that return to the position that is at the essence of their statement, which, which was very, very well crafted, uh, very subtle, very well crafted. This isn't a criticism of the statement, but it does try to situate it uh, in, in, in a way that kind of suggests that what they're, they're doing, they, there's a longing in that statement for what they had thought to be an unimpeachable a unitary consensus about the nature and the role of human rights and the expectations of states within it and the way it manifests itself. And all of a sudden they're confronted with a quite vigorous view, which has now been memorialized into law by a state that tends to have a different view and whose own, whose adoption of this consensus view only takes it so far, right? And so yeah. you have a statement then that sort of suggests this, it's, it's not so much bewilderment as a sense of, well, 
should we even be, should we have to do this? The fact that we do have to do this kind of suggests that we're no longer in the position to take what we took as, to, to take for granted the fundamental premises that we assume that everyone had bought into. Um, unifying internationalism, a sense of a particular view of human rights grounded in the individual and a sense of the limitations or constraints of the state in the context of its uh, management of civil and political rights. So the statement is, can be um, drawn down into being more of a suggestion in some ways, would you say? Well, eh, I don't know if it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not so much a suggestion as in a come back to where we were. Uh, there, there are a number of strands here. One of the strands is, of course, uh, the, the, the very um, significantly long tension between the privileging of civil and political rights on the one hand uh, and, um, and uh, economic, social, and cultural rights on the other. Uh, the other is the way in which or the extent to which one can privilege or situate human rights within a collective as opposed to centering human rights within uh, among autonomous individual actors, right? These are old and well-known tensions and, and they have surfaced from time to time, certainly since the 60s and 70s. And there's a bit of that there. But the other part here that, that made this really nostalgic was the sense of their conception of the role and primacy of international law and of international law instruments, in particular, their reference to the 1984 uh, joint, uh, the Sino-UK Joint Declaration, their notion that indeed Hong Kong is a special place, the autonomy of which, including the protection of its international uh, human rights law, is grounded in international law, which then acts as a sovereignty constraining uh, element, and the fact that China has effectively rejected that in asserting a very different view of the extent of international law, which ended to the extent that you're looking at the, the, the Sino-UK Joint Declaration that ended at the time of the, um, of the reseeding of parts of what had been the crown colony and uh, to China and the return of lease lands at the same time, because it was, it's, it's a, a double kind of transaction here. Um, the, the sense that once that was done, uh, the role of international law was done and that to the extent international law would be permitted to permeate the, the, um, the, the SAR, the Hong Kong SAR, it would have to go through the national organs rather than somehow be able to work around it and uh, project itself directly into Hong Kong. And that was in a sense the where we wind up after 2020. Uh, mm -hmm. And in part, it's, it's, it's a kind of foreshadowing of what we're going to see developing uh, as the major actors begin to confront the, situ the evolving situation in Hong Kong and then develop their own discursive rhetorical and ideologically driven views about what all this means and therefore their role and the constraints and their authority uh, to manage or to intervene uh, within that space uh, of Hong Kong. You know, it's interesting because I remember, I believe it was the first day I took a class with you, you said that law was based in authority. Um, do you believe that within this statement or embedded within this statement, there is a recognition of um, the fading away or the losing of that authority by those who, you know, hold, hold high the golden age of human rights or international law? Well, it, it certainly is a challenge to what appeared to have been an unstoppable trajectory towards the triumph of a particular way of understanding, making, and rolling out international, not just law, because that can be viewed as very narrow, but international law and norms uh, in ways that would then uh, be given pride of place and either adopted or uh, be highly influential in ordering 
uh, the, uh, the, the legal management, the constitutional orders of states uh, that would be viewed as increasingly subject to either formally or informally that view. Uh, and, and China comes along and almost at the same time that the Trump administration comes along and in its own way begins to uh, echo these, these kinds of sentiments and say, uh, well, not really. Um, we tend to have a very different view. Uh, we're very sympathetic to the development of international consensus. Uh, we are looking for win-win uh, relationships with our international brothers and sisters, and we, uh, we applaud and we're becoming more vigorous um, participants within the international organizations that represents the spaces within which international consensus can be developed. But at the same time, we are tremendously uh, protective of the sovereign authority of our nation and we tend to center the, um, the fundamental ordering premises of our political economic model, that is the ideological premises on which a state is founded. And in the absence of a formal legally binding commitment to change or modify that, then it remains the in the discretion of the state, both to receive international law, to interpret it, and then to naturalize it within its own borders. Um, so throughout all of this, of course, China is taking the position that it is absolutely and positively abiding by international law as it understands and interprets it, and as it is it, within its own sovereign authority to make those interpretations and applications within its territory. And this is being done ironically at the same time that uh, Mr. Trump is attempting to do similar things uh, within the United States and then in reordering uh, the, uh, the US relationships with its own, um, with its own um, colleague, uh, and, and allied states and, and within the international space uh, in which it occupies. And so there's this tension. And in the process, of course, um, you're left with the, the special procedures and the, the, the centering of the old international efforts, right? This trajectory of movement towards uh, globalization uh, within a legalized international sphere. And all of a sudden they're looking around and they go, wait a minute you know, this isn't where we were moving. We're in uh, different places in many ways. In different places in many ways. And yet it is a beautifully illogic, a beautiful lamentation in a sense of a sense of what it ought to look like assuming the continuation of that trajectory. Um, and I say that, of course, it, it sounds like it's all past, uh, but you know the, the system still has extraordinarily influential and powerful adherence within the American elite, within some sections of the Chinese elite, uh, and heavily, heavily still fortified uh, within uh, the European Union and among European states. Um, even though there may be some fracture there uh, from, from time to time. So when, when I talk about this in, in terms of elegies and lamentations and homesickness, I'm talking about the way in which these elites then confront the actions of, in this case, China, but China in the context of China and the United States, basically now acting out, this is 2019, 2020, um, acting in ways that kind of suggest that they are no longer necessarily willing or passive partners in this enterprise um, that is being operated by or through and being developed by all of these formal and informal organs of the UN in Geneva and New York and their associated international organizations and their allied non-governmental organizations and the sympathetic interpretations of large factions of other and mostly European countries. So when you speak about these two uh, interpretations or many, there may be more than two interpretations that are had, but two by the giants, uh, the United States and the uh, you know, Marxist-Leninist camp, 
when you talk about that and you speak about one group having to create a message that is sent out to them and they're going to create their own interpretation based off of that message, are they embedding two different messages to suffice the two camps? And, and the way I thought about it when I was reading it was, in, a, in some ways like Harry Potter, I don't know if you ever watched the movie, there is a train station. There is a train station and you get to, um, I believe it's stay in uh, stop number nine or section nine and three fourths. And there's a whole new train station in which you can run through a wall to get to. Is there not even a hidden message, but an embedded message or two separate camps because they understand the way that it will be interpreted by both camps. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's actually a, an excellent point. As, as you were talking, I was thinking, oh my Lord, I'm the person who's gonna run into the wall and then break my arm because I'm just not going to get <laughs> through it. Um, there is, yes, um, there is to some extent a bit of that. And there is, you know, of, of course, in, in documents like this, the, the documents are open-ended enough so that you can interpret it any way you like. And the object, of course, of all of this was not merely to berate. Everyone understands the, the disaster. This goes back to Jimmy Carter's famous speech, where if you lecture people to death, they, you tend to lose the next election or you tend to lose their confidence. People like things uh, done in, in happy, positive ways as opposed to um, not so happy, positive ways. But all the same, um, yes, there is some room for maneuvering, but at the same time, they, the, the statement itself reminds the participants or its addressees of what they believe to be lines in the sand. The problem, as you noted, is that when you draw lines in the sand, a windstorm can come. Uh, or someone can come after and redraw it, or the, the line itself disappears. Drawing lines in sand can mean both that there are things against which you will then do something, or it may mean that it is so fragile that the best you can hope for is the line drawing itself that is a gesture. And in this case, and that's why I loved your question. In this case, in a sense, that's what we wind up having here. Uh, because you have a statement that lays out the, and in, in a clearer way as, as one can get, uh, not only the old consensus, but the application of the old consensus to what the, its elite gatekeepers, uh, its, its elite um, protectors view as a fundamental violation of both form and substance, but at the same time, beyond the statement itself, there's nothing. Mm. And so in a sense, what, what you're being told, and the, the United States is very used to this in a lot of ways, certainly since 2016, uh, world where, and, and to some extent during the Vietnam War and in other times as well, uh, a, a, a large and powerful state will be lectured. Uh, and the lecturing is a gesture. It's a gesture that carries within it a warning about the thinking of various elites and a, a more subtle warning in a sense of their, of their potential for then developing uh, positions of resistance but at the same time, beyond the statement, what is there? There's nothing, there's a statement. And so the Chinese can look at the statement and say, thank you very much. We understand what you're saying. Um, we understand where you're coming from. And they could even be magnanimous and suggest, uh, we even um, acknowledge that your statement is inevitable given your ideological starting points, mm -hmm. right? But, at the same time, our ideological starting points are quite different. Um, we tend to value those things that you have identified in different ways. And we reserve to ourselves the right thereafter, therefore to apply it in ways that are consistent with our own legitimating constitutional premises and principles. Pause. And this is the part that no one wants to hear. What are you going to do about it? The answer from the UN is, is, of course, very little. The answer from the Americans 
in the context of what by then was uh, what started out as a quote unquote trade war, which became a war of renewed ideological difference, uh, which then became a more large scale contest for controls of, of, um, of global production, which became a larger contest over uh, much more interesting um, kinds of things. Um, in that context, the Americans, and to some extent the Brits uh, and the Europeans much, much more reluctantly to the extent that they're willing to do this at all, uh, began to do a couple of things. And, and this of course gets discussed later on in, in the book. Uh, one is a series of targeted sanctions, of course, the value of which beyond gesture and irritation is, is questionable. And, and we'll raise that when we get into the later chapters. Um, and then the other thing that this does is provide a, uh, a sort of convenient, um, a convenient um, set of activities uh, which can both uh, justify and then accelerate uh, efforts to decouple the economies, not to separate them, right? We're not going to isolate them, but to decouple them. And so you wind up having two quite distinct um, economic systems that will be heavily intercut in that will be heavily not in interconnected, but will have heavy relationships between them, but will no longer be striving towards a unifying integration uh, as opposed to a very lively um, commercial relationship based on transactions, uh, but, uh, but also quite mindful of separation and the distinction of interest. And so that also comes out in, in this first chapter as well. Because at the end of all of this, right, um, the, the, the contest that we see developing starting on June 9th, which brings together um, the, the protesters in Hong Kong, their antagonists at the local level, uh, the central authorities in Beijing, and then the international community, both the public international community in the form of key states, the US and the UK, and then increasingly Australia and, 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 and other countries, and then international organizations as the protectors of the international uh, legal environment. That then, um, it, 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 what develops from here is the sense of the willingness to develop significant rhetorical positions, but the unwillingness, except in the case of the Americans and, and to what extent we, we will debate later on, the unwillingness to do anything more than that. And in that context, of course, uh, the Chinese can then weigh and balance, the central authorities can weigh and balance consequences and then uh, move their system, make decisions on the basis of a protection of their own principles and premises in moving their vision forward of the country and its operation. And I'm sure that leads to great um, aggravation by some and satisfactory for others. Um, but I, I think that we have talked about chapter one. I think that you thoroughly uh, went through it and explained it to the potential readers out there. Um, thank you for talking about chapter one with me. And thank you for watching chapter one, all those viewers out there. Um, video two for chapter two will be out very soon following this. Thank you, Professor Packer. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.